Hi, this is Rahman Sheikh. Welcome to Fortnightly Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. I am the host and railway systems specialist working in this industry for 24 years and counting. This podcast is primarily focused on railway experts who have vast amount of experience and contributed greatly to this amazing industry. This is not a technical seminar, but focuses on feel-good stories, individual journeys, their success and failures, motivating younger generation to kickstart their career in railways and creating a sense of pride for the railway people who devoted their lives on the most environment-friendly public transportation. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of Railway Transportation Systems. Today, we have the honor of hosting a distinguished professional who has played a pivotal role in ensuring the safety and reliability of rail transportation systems. Our guest today is Paul Appleton, a seasoned expert and the HM Deputy Chief Inspector of Railways at the Office of Rail and Road. With a wealth of experience and an extensive background in the railway safety, Paul has been at the forefront of implementing and overseeing safety regulations that govern one of the most critical modes of transportation. Throughout his career, Paul Appleton has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to enhancing railway safety standards. His profound expertise and leadership as a Deputy Chief Inspector of Railways have been instrumental in shaping policies and protocols aimed at safeguarding passengers, workers and the public at large. Paul's strategic insights coupled with his dedication to innovation in safety measures have not only set benchmarks within the industry but also contributed significantly to the evolution of safety practices within rail transportation. Apart from his role at ORR, Paul Appleton is a recognized figure in the field, often contributing valuable perspectives on railway safety through conference conferences, publications, and advisory roles. Listeners, get ready for an enlightening conversation as we delve into the intricate world of railway safety, regulations, technological advancements, and the future of safe and efficient rail transportation systems with our esteemed guest, Paul Appleton. Hi, Paul. Welcome to Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for joining us as well back from uk early morning 7 a.m so let's start with my first generic question can you share a bit about your journey and how you became involved in the field of railway safety what inspired you to work in this critical area so i came at it from a slightly different angle to a lot of people i was uh, born and brought up on a family farm and uh, i still live on it still live on one actually and i ended up working in the agricultural industry and i saw my fair share of incidents and accidents but about 40 years ago one in particular i do remember very clearly and that was not great i subsequently saw an advert in for a job for the agricultural health and safety inspectorate with the health and safety executive and i thought oh sounds interesting and i applied and that was back in 1989 and i ended up inspecting all sorts of farms and then fairly rapidly after that i ended up in factories schools universities, all sorts of workplaces, doing all sorts of things. And then I spent a fair amount of time doing construction safety. So I live fairly near uh, Brighton on the southeast, and uh, I spent an unfortunate amount of time sitting in coroner's courts and other things, telling the world about what I found and so on. But back in the year 2000, the UK was going through a difficult period with regard to railway safety. And HSC was looking for some more inspectors to go into the railway inspectorate. So I put my hand up and I was one of 25 people that was recruited. So it was a very large expansion of the railway inspectorate at the time. That's how I got into railway safety. So whilst I had a a sort of passing interest in railways, it wasn't a passion of mine at the time, but I was passionate about health and safety and those sorts of things. And we got thrown in at the deep end with some very intensive training and then getting straight out there and out and on the railway. Beautiful story, Paul. Agriculture to railway. I hope you are enjoying your current job. I am. 
Thank you. And uh, Paul, as the Her Majesty Deputy Chief Inspector of Railways at ORR, what are the primary responsibilities and objectives of your role? Could you walk us through a typical day or the main tasks you handle? Okay, so I'm actually partly retired now. I've gone back to my farming route, so I help run a farm. But for the other half of the week, I am a project manager, I suppose you'd call me, but dealing with everything and anything in and around the railway inspectorate. So looking at items such as ORR's capacity on software assurance. So we have some quite deep concerns around digitization of the railway and how the software is being assured. Cybersecurity to a certain extent, but we're not the lead agency for that uh, in the UK. So I've spent some time making sure we've got training programs in place for our staff, developing question sets with external experts so we can sort of tell the inspectors, ask these sorts of questions. This is what good looks like. And more importantly, this is what bad looks like and working with them and try to put some improvement in the sort of capacity and capability around this entire area. It's an area where I think we've needed a bit more work. UK Railway's also been looking at a restructuring programme, so I've been involved a little bit at the safety working group on that around management of change, development of case management systems. Uh, So this is sort of just the internal wiring of how do we manage information coming in and out and all those sorts of things. And I also act as a mentor. So I've been hanging around this place for quite a long time. I've got a lot of experience across the piece. So I'm there to provide some sort of background and expertise to help people who've got one of those problems. They go, mm, not quite sure to handle it. And that's just a way of sort of talking things through people, giving them a, a sounding board to deal with questions and making some suggestions. But mostly it's about helping them through the decision-making process. Before that, I actually ran all of the inspection program for the mainline railway in the UK, both infrastructure and trains, which was an interesting challenge. We had about 60-odd inspectors uh, working for me at that point, doing everything from frontline inspection through to investigations. Big team, Paul. You got quite a lot on the plate. Mm -hmm. But that mentorship part is really crucial because as you started working part-time, I think that's a good idea. You mentor the youngsters so that they can take over. And I think you covered most of the topics, but the most important one I would like to press on is the safety aspect. So in your view, what are the some of the most pressing safety challenges currently facing the railway industry and how is ORR addressing these challenges? Okay, so I'll just run through a little list first of all. Management of extreme weather, fatigue management, infrastructure maintenance, software of various sorts. And of course, we also deal with other parts away from the main line. So we also deal with heritage and trams and non-main lines such as London Underground. So there are some interesting asset management challenges in all of those and also the people challenge but going back to the top of the list so extreme weather we've all seen extreme weather we certainly have in the UK and I know Australia where you are has more than its fair share of extreme weather I suspect you do it better than we do but we've been working very hard with our infrastructure manager in particular network rail pushing them to work out how they can improve their management of that and so for example at the moment they've worked with other organizations to develop a decision sports support tool which is about how do you make a decision in bad weather so try and pour in as much data as you can get about what the weather's doing right now but all more importantly what's it been doing for the last few weeks months so how wet is the ground how likely is it actually going to flood what do you know about the trees in the area all sorts of things you can pour data into so you end up with a big model and then when the forecasters say we've got an amber warning for wind which in the uk means there is a possibility of trees falling down over the railway line for example or washouts and floods, then what are you going to do? Are you going to impose a blanket speed restriction which causes massive performance issues? Or are you going to be a bit more nuanced? And that's the whole point of the tool is to try and help them instead of knocking out in vast areas of railway, instead say, actually, I know we think this line here is okay. We can maybe take 10 mile an hour off the speed limit. But over there, really concerned about the amount of water sitting in the ground. We're going to have to put a a serious speed limit on it. We're worried about flooding or trees or something like that. Fatigue management. We are currently working through a an update to our guidance. Fatigue has a massive role to play in good decision making by competent staff. So your staff can be perfectly competent, know what they're doing and all the rest of it. But if you've fatigued them, then they will make better 
poor mistake. And we've certainly had some examples of um, extreme fatigue. And in particular, we had one where two guys were driving home from a work site to a depot at 3 a.m. in the morning and they drove straight into the back of a stationary lorry and killed. Both of them were killed. They'd been at work for sort of 18, 19 hours at the time. And that was really not on. So we prosecuted the company concern. Infrastructure maintenance. <clears throat> so the other thing that ORR does is look at the economics of the railway. So as a safety regulator, we work closely with the economic regulator, the economic regulating half of ORR and the government who set how much money we've got to spend on the railway. Now, the government, like across the piece, has been careful with the money and that has meant that Newer Rail has had to make some different difficult choices about how much money to spend on renewing the railway as opposed to maintaining and mending the railway. Now, traditionally, the way you dealt with it, a lot of this stuff was to renew it. Therefore, you could then leave the railway and it just existed. You didn't need to do too much apart from some general inspection work. But the amount of renewal is going to go down in the fourth, next five years. So we need to make sure that Network Rail is really up to speed on its maintenance and how it's going to maintain that railway going forward to keep it in a safe state. Software, I've already mentioned about improving yep. our capacity to inspect this. Modern trains are fly-by-wire software-driven. We've certainly seen some interesting examples of where trains have gone wrong due to software issues. These are not cyber attacks. These are either software design failures or designers making decisions that had unintended consequences. So what are we going to do? How are we going to push to ensure that the software on modern trains and in the infrastructure as well, but we're concentrating on trains at present, is actually being delivered properly. And that's uh, where we're spending some time. Wow. So that's where we are with all the main line stuff anyway. Quite a few things, weather, fatigue, maintenance, software. There are quite a few things which are uh, really challenging issues. And I think the ORR is addressing it quite well. But there is a follow-up question. How is technology playing a role in this and trying to help you out, especially AI. I think nowadays in podcast, I'm speaking a lot about AI and trying to become an ambassador for AI. So how do you foresee the integration of new technologies such as AI, IoT or automation shaping the future of railway safety and operations? I can see some real opportunities in AI in terms of taking those vast pools of data that the railway can generate. So, for example, in the Great Britain now, we have an awful lot of trains that are fitted for forward-facing CCTV systems. So, sitting in the driver's cab looking out, can you take that video and turn it into intelligence? So, we're working, well, not us, but the infrastructure is looking at that and then bringing in information from helicopter LIDAR surveys. So, fly over to see what the ground profiles are doing, photographic surveys, so you can track the condition of trees along the side of the railway line and AI systems can be used to bring all of that together because in sort of under the old way of doing it with a literally somebody sitting there stepping the way through a railway through a video and making notes or getting in the cab and making notes as they go along works but it takes hell of a lot more effort to do it that way than if you can persuade a machine to do an awful lot of that grunt work and then present it as a set of intelligence that somebody can go okay the risk is here i've got two lines i've got some money to spend do i spend it there or do i spend it there or actually the problem is never that easy it's never an a or a b it's it's an a to a Z type thing, where do I spend the money and how do I spread it around? So that, that can really help you with that. And we've also started to see introduction of AI to train maintenance systems. So again, trains spit out vast amounts of data about what's happening to them. That's all fed back into maintenance databases. And therefore, you can start to see problems developing on trains before they become realized. So you can get in there and make repairs or change out components before the train actually fails. So you can pick it up on a, and do a quick piece of work uh, of an evening rather than doing that. Yeah, Preventive or corrective maintenance. maintenance. Yeah. I always have to put a caveat to all of these sorts of things. At present, what we're seeing is that these AI systems are remote from immediate safety critical systems. So they're not, if they screw up, then they are not going to immediately cause an accident. They are at one step removed and there are alternative controls in place. So a driver reports vegetation encroachment. Train maintainers doing maintenance will pick up issues on trains if they're not being spotted by the AI systems or whatever. But if you are persuading an AI to make safety critical decisions, then I think you're moving into an area where I would be a, quite a lot more cautious than we were with the previous examples. Now, if an AI system can explain 
explain to you why it's made a decision the way it's made it a white box as they as it's described then i think you can get live with that so you can say okay i can see all the facts it's taken for it. why it's weighted them why it's weighted i can understand its decision but an awful lot of ai systems are designed as black boxes you just feed vast amounts of data in it and then it spits out an answer you haven't got a clue how it's got to that answer. Even the people that wrote the IAI or designed it and trained it don't know why it gave that answer. And we've certainly seen examples, not in the railway industry, of where some very odd things have popped out for those sorts of things. There is a real caveat in my mind around some of these AI systems when you're taking talking about that frontline safety critical decision making. Beautiful insights. Great answer, Paul. Thanks for sharing that. Moreover, moving into my next question, which is somewhat like a follow-up question, collaboration and and communication are crucial in ensuring safety across the rail network. How does ORR work with other stakeholders such as operators, manufacturers, government bodies to maintain and improve safety standards? So a huge part of the health and safety inspectors day-to-day job is around influencing. So yes, we've got enforcement powers and occasionally we use them when things go badly wrong or if we don't believe a company is going to do something we think it should. But actually, 99% of what we do is influence. So you can either do that on a one-to-one in the meeting room with an individual, or as what I spend most of my time doing, is actually meeting with groups of organizations. Now, in the UK, we have a body called the Railway Safety and Standards Board, and that all railway companies in the UK are obliged under their license to be members of that. And that, that is all about collaboration and communication, and bringing people together to agree standards, to talk through issues and all that. So last week, for example, I was there and we were talking about cybersecurity and developing a bow tie model for cybersecurity in the railway industry. And that's a very typical sort of thing they would do across the industry. Paul ORR has been very good at collaboration, very influential and very instrumental in setting safety standards. Can you highlight some recent initiatives or policies implemented by ORR to enhance railway safety? So ORR per se does not set standards for the Great Britain's railway industry. That is actually done by collaboration through the Railway Safety and Standards Board. Now, we sit on, my boss, for example, is a board member at RSSB. I sit on various committees and so do lots of other people in it to influence and persuade and offer our insights into things. But actually, when it comes down to it, the standards in the Great British Railway are actually developed by the industry for the industry. So there is no excuse when they say we can't do it because they were there, they signed it. So in many ways, I think that is a really powerful tool. And the other advantage that we've got with, through the RSSB is the fact that they have been collecting accident data. So not just the stuff that's reportable to us, the really serious end, but everything. Be it a slip, trip and fall on a, on a platform where nobody got seriously hurt, but it was reportable all the way through to the, the big stuff. And they've managed to build a really quite sophisticated safety risk model of operations in the mainline railway. And that really provides you with some hard data about likelihood and, and you can really start to get into what the precursors to accidents and if i want to stop the accident what are the precursors to it how likely are they which are the key ones i need to really get into and influence that's a, one of the key ways that we do this well great way of uh, delivering it we spoke a lot about orr how it faces the safety challenges how it monitors the safety uh, how influential or instrumental orr has been and the collaboration aspect as well including automation now let's move to the innovation aspect with an increasing demand for railway transport and advancement in technology how do you balance innovation and safety within the industry so continuous improvement is built into UK health and safety law. So if it was good enough 20 years ago, it probably isn't good enough now. Technology has moved on. The way that we do things has moved on. So there is this constant drive to improve. Otherwise, you go backwards. So we set a target. uh, Our strategy asks for excellence to prevent fatalities and major injuries across the industry. And the only way you're going to achieve that is to continuously improve. Because if you stop improving, you stop innovating, then things go 
go backwards and they get worse. So you need to understand your risk. Yep. And this is where I mentioned the RSSB risk model. And that really is a very useful tool to help us understand risk. It's not the only way of doing it. Um, it's certainly where you're looking at stuff that's novel and you've just to end up going back to fundamentals. So for example, the discussion I had about the bow tie on cybersecurity, that's not in the risk model at the moment. So that's why we're looking at it through a different technique. So you've got to sit down with industry to try and work out where do we need to make change? What can we do to improve things? I mentioned forward-facing CCTV. 20 years ago, these things didn't exist. Or if they did, they were like a one-off for a particular purpose. Whereas now they're becoming ubiquitous. They're automatically uploaded. They enable they're, all sorts of information is being taken back out of those systems rather than just sitting there passively and waiting for it to go wrong, which was where they started out as a tool for dealing with um, signals passed at danger. Was the signal really red? Or as the driver said, no, 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 it was it uh, amber or green or whatever. And then you go, oh, sorry, it was actually at red. <laughs> Um, and you get to the bottom of what actually happened really quickly. Whereas now that you can pull a lot more intelligence out of that video rather than that simple yes or no question that was originally asked. So those are the sort of things that where we're moving forwards on innovation. Well, wow. great insights, Paul. So after innovation, how about training? What role does continuous training and education play in ensuring the competency of railway staff and enhancing the safety protocols, especially seniors like you, where you started working part-time and started mentoring. Where do you think this continuous railway helps us? Competence is fundamental for railway safety. If you haven't got competence, then you might as well go up, to be honest. It is built into our legislation that requires uh, the railways competent. It's also built into our legislation that all of our inspectors are competent. So they have to be good when we hire them, we have to train them and, and all the rest of it. And it's about, so we've published a detailed guidance on developing and maintaining staff competence. It's a few years old now, but fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with it. And competence is about the ability to work to an agreed standard on a regular basis. And an awful lot of what we do in the railway is making sure we do the same thing every day. Now, that doesn't remove the human element in it. But if you've got people up to a standard, then you can get there. If you look now at train driving in the UK and the improvements that have been made over the last 25 years to train driving, they have now got the competence of train drivers up to what is thought by human factors experts to be at the limits of human performance. So people make mistakes. They will. It doesn't matter if you're making a cup of tea, which is the sort of normal, you will put the milk or the sugar or the tea bag in in the wrong order or put it back in the... Or people make mistakes even when they want to do it right. But competence gets you to that basic level. And then depending on how serious it is, is how many layers. So if you end up in your Swiss cheese model of how many layers of control you want to put in place as to how serious it is. If you're making a cup of tea, none. If you're running a railway, lots. Of layers of control. Great insights and great explanation, Paul. It's as if like I'm listening from a teacher. <laughs> the most important aspect of our today's podcast is safety. So let's go back to the safety. Passenger safety is a top priority. What steps are being taken to improve safety measures for passengers, especially during emergencies or unforeseen events? Um, so we spend a huge amount of time looking at asset safety, both from infrastructure and the rolling stock, and they are fundamental to achieving good passenger safety. We've talked about the people. Now we're talking about the, the objects, as it were. So we're constantly looking at our infrastructure of operator, network rail primarily, and the train operators to ensure that they keep their assets in a safe state and they are operating and coordinating properly. The industry is moving away from some of the more traditional systems of routine visual inspections, also the old-fashioned track walk, the basic visual inspection. And, for example, in Great Britain, it, the track walk has largely been replaced now by the plain line pattern recognition system, which runs on our measurement train fleets. So it's taking video shots at oh, thousands of times a second, running it through AI systems along backed up by people that can spot faults in the track at line speed. Uh, modern rolling stock is designed to improve survivability in crashes. We've seen some amazing crashes where we've had trains, uh, if you go all the way back to Lambrick, which was oh, 10, 12 years ago now. But those trains stayed in one piece. They protected the trains, even though they came off, rolled down the embankment. There was one lady who did die in that particular accident. Everybody else on those trains, even though they went 
down an embankment survive. So keeping those trains in a good state is key. And it starts with design, it goes all the way through to the maintenance and their operation. Oh, great insights, Paul. But I got a quick follow-up question before I move to my next question. How does ORR stay proactive in anticipating and mitigating potential safety hazards, just as you said now, or risks before they escalate? So we do a regular program of horizon scanning. So trying to look about what might be coming out over the hill, just trying to understand those risks the industry is facing, decide where we're going to spend our resources to mitigate those risks. We maintain a risk register, which goes which is reviewed on a regular basis. And then at sort of frontline inspector type level, we do an annual review where we sit down with all the data. We look at what the accidents have happened. Incidents, doesn't matter where the source of the information is, we're, we're not proud, we'll take it from anywhere. And try and understand where are those risks and where are we going to spend our time concentrating in the future. Now, that doesn't always mean it's a frontline inspection that we carry out. It might we meet with people at head office values. We might be going and looking at the data. We might be going back to RSSB and talking to them about standards. There are all sorts of techniques you can use to tackle those risks. It's not just about going out and looking on the front line. Well, great answer, Paul. So looking ahead, what do you envision as the most significant developments or advancements in railway safety over the next decade or so? So I think the digitization of the railway, I think the railway has been slightly behind. It certainly has been in the UK where a lot of other industries have been with digitization. I think there are some opportunities, some great strides forward in safety and efficiency and just delivering a better experience to the passenger. If you look at what modern apps can tell you about where your train is, what it's doing, why is it late, which platforms are coming in on, there's all sorts of stuff you can pull out nowadays. It keeps people informed. It helps you sort the issues out. And when things go wrong, it can try and help you to understand where some of the roots of those problems, however. But it's always about um, digitization brings its own risks. So where software doesn't do quite what you are expecting it to do or where other people have managed to get into it. So cybersecurity issues where people have gone in and made changes. Now, to my knowledge, we've not had a cybersecurity failure that has resulted injury to anyone in the UK on the railway network. We've certainly had cybersecurity attacks, but surprise, surprise, they've gone after the money primarily or wanted to cause a bit of chaos, but we've not had anybody hurt. But there's a really big but in there. It will happen Great. at some point. Great answer, Paul. I really like the way you're explaining the things, especially using of technology but at the same time applying conventional safety principles. It's a right way of uh, moving ahead and making the railway more safe to travel. Finally, I come to my last question. What advice or key measures would you give to aspiring professionals or organizations aiming to contribute to improving railway safety globally? Um. I suppose I'd say just get involved. The industry is absolutely fascinating, but you have to be prepared to challenge what people are doing today. Just because it's been done for many years before doesn't make it the safest way of doing things now. I've challenged a lot of people when they come back to me where they say, well, I've always done it this way. And then you go back with that really interesting question, why? And they look at you really weirdly. Well, I've always done it this way. Now, why have you always done it this way? Have you thought about doing it differently? Have you challenged those underlying assumptions? Have you done read on your risk assessment lately have you looked at it and i think the powerful set of questions that anybody can take is who what why when where and how it's incredibly powerful uh, you don't really need any other questions when you're going in and challenging and asking to understand they're good for journalists they work perfectly well for health and safety inspectors as well well great advice paul it was pleasure talking to you and thank you very much for sparing some time and coming onto this platform to share your wisdom I believe everyone listening to this podcast has got something to take away from today's discussion. If you like this podcast, please listen, follow and share this podcast within your network. If you believe we should be sharing your story or someone within your network, there is a railway leader who should be here sharing his or her contribution to this industry. Contact me on railway transportation systems at gmail.com thank you for your time today see you next fortnight until then stay safe and take care of yourself